the book of John's Gospel at chapter 18. And while you turn, the pastor made a request, just a request, that I bring the message tonight or today sometime on how the Lord saved me from infidelity. I organized an infidels club in the Southern Baptist College, had over 300 young Baptists join my club. I was the president of it. I found out it's a lot easier to lead men to hell than it is to Christ. And I, God showed mercy to this infidel. I'd like for us to think a little while tonight about what infidelity is. Somebody said there are no atheists in foxholes. There are no atheists anywhere. Everybody believes there's a supreme being, you're a human being. But there are infidels, and they're in our pulpits, teaching our Sunday school classes, gracing our pews. Infidels, a fellow that says, I know there's a God, but he's not going to run my life. No God for me. And to be honest with you, that's what churches are manufacturing now. People who with their lips claim Jesus as Savior, but have built a fence about their life and told God to stay out. Hell's going to be so full of Baptist preachers and Baptist deacons and Baptist Sunday school teachers that will be running over because they profess with their mouths but where their hearts do not know the living Lord and the Lord of life. Now, I hope the Lord will not hurt in the services, not let me hurt you, but it's a little difficult to listen to me because I am a hitchhiker. I go from place to place, and usually it takes people a week to know what I'm talking about, and you can't get much out of a message unless you've heard me a few times. Because whether I'm right or wrong, I've been crossing the grain of our Baptist so-called doctrine. I'm inside now, I'm not on the outside. I am a Baptist. <clears throat> but we Baptists have been filling hell full of church members, and I've been screaming against it. Now I hope that you can hear me this morning. There are three questions that deserve an answer. First, they ought to be asked, and then they ought to be answered. I'm aware of the fact that nobody is asking these questions now, but I pose them for you anyhow. The most important question you'll ever ask, if you ever get around to it, is who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Now, everybody in the world today got some opinion about who Jesus is. But unless you come up by revelation with God's answer, you'll split hell wide open. Richard Neighbor, one of the prophetic voices of this hour, quotes from one of the Russian Dostovskis, I can't pronounce that word, D-O-E-S-T-O-V-S-K-Y, Dostovsky, <laughs> one of his novels, in which this Russian tells this fable, of course, of a man who walked for a thousand years to get one look at Jesus. And then he walked a thousand years back home. And when he got back home after the 2,000 year interval of walking, somebody said, was it worth it? And he said, yes, it was worth it. That almost breaks your heart. 
When you remember that we as Baptists made salvation by man's decision instead of God revealing of Christ some 40 years ago, and that this generation is a total stranger to the Christ of the Bible. And if you have any of the milk of human kindness, much less a little drop of the grace of God within you, you wish you could put your arms around this generation of church people and get them to take time to get just one look at the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I don't guess you've got time. Well, the preachers will get you to make a decision, and they'll bury you, and they'll send you to hell. Because you're so busy, you'll never have Christ in all of his glory made real to you. That's salvation. The second most important question you'll ever face, you ever find out who Jesus is, it wouldn't do any good to trust him unless he's the Jesus of the Bible, would it? And the Jesus of the Bible and the Jesus of our church circles, not the same. The second most important question you'll ever face, and I hope you'll ask it someday, I don't expect you've got time, most folks are too busy to go to heaven, is what did Jesus do on that cross? And what's he doing now on that throne that'll do you any good anyhow? Did he do anything <laughs> that you need to be done in your behalf? while he hung on that tree outside the city of Jerusalem that had helped you. You need anybody do anything for you on a tree, shed his blood? Most folks don't. They say, I'm as good as the church people. Well, that ain't nothing to brag about. They're not interested in whether Jesus did anything on the cross or not. They just don't care. You think I'm wrong, you go out on the streets a minute. I looked for 15 minutes for it this morning. I haven't found it yet. <laughs> Reading out a little late. I don't know where Bennett is. The preacher said this outfit here was in Bennett, but I don't know about that. I'm going, I'm going to investigate after service. And uh, I wonder, wonder what Jesus is doing now, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. What if he doing anything now that would do you any good? You could get an interest in it. And the third most important question that anybody will ever ask I doubt if you'll ever ask it and come up with the right answer is what does it mean to be vitally united to this Jesus who did something on a tree outside the city of Jerusalem and the Bible says he's doing something now at the right hand of God's majesty on high. Reckon you need any, any of that? The old Mother Hubbard of the English language now is S-A-V-E-D saved. It doesn't mean a thing on God's earth to the average person. This morning, will you let me, I'm going to whether you let me or not, but will you try to hear me? As I speak to you on the second of these three questions, I do it because I hope that you're not a Sunday morning outfit and that you'll do what your beloved young pastor has urged. Try to get a hearing for the message. The Lord has 
save many thousands of people as I brought the message of bring tonight may not save anybody. He's running it, you know. But I wish you could get them to hear me. And I hope this message will help you hear me tonight. Why did Jesus die on a cross and God raised him from the dead? Now, the only Jesus we have any record at all of is a Jesus who was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on a tree, was buried in another man's tomb, but didn't stay there. God raised him from the dead and exalted him made him prime minister, totalitarian dictator, absolute despot of everything that rives and rigs. Now, that's the only Jesus we got any record of at all. Of course, I know that seminary professors, and I'm a graduate of one of them. By the way, I'm going to get to be on a conference in Arkansas with Dr. Pinnock, from, he's the fellow that's been stirring us Baptists up, so I'm looking forward to that. And Dr. Vaughn of Southwestern, and Dr. Havlick of the Home Mission Board, and Dr. Milliken of the Southern Baptist College in Arkansas. And you won't believe it, Curtis, it's a Sovereign Grace Conference. And one half of the Southern Baptist preachers of Arkansas are to be the invited guest. I'm looking forward to that. I tried to straighten out the seminary professors. 35, 6, 40 years ago, but they wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> and, but I'm going to have time with them. Well, I won't charge anything extra for that. I know that people have invented a Jesus other than the one of the Bible. But we, the only record we got of them is in the minds of those unsaved men. The only Jesus we've got any kind of evidence that ever existed is the Jesus this book talks about. Now, what did he do? And why did he do it on the cross? And what's he doing now? And what good would it do anyhow? In the 18th chapter of the Gospel of John, the Lord Jesus, just before his crucifixion, is before the Roman governor of, of the Jews, a fellow by the name of Pilate. And I just ask you to look at verse, one, just verse 37 of this 18th chapter of John. This is not my text, but it'll prepare you for the text. Pilate, that's the Roman governor, therefore said unto him, that's the Lord Jesus, Art thou a king then? Remember, Pilate didn't know who he's talking to. Pilate said, Are you a king? They claim you claim to be. And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. Now watch it carefully. To this end, for this purpose, was I born. And for this cause came I into the world. I was born to be a king. And that's the reason I came into the world. Now, language couldn't be any plainer than that. That I should bear witness unto the truth. And the Lord, when he was here as God's prophet, explained his death and demonstrated his kingship. He'd speak to the way, be still, and they'd be still. He'd the command to the demons to depart, and they'd skedaddle to the heart. He demonstrated, this is the area of the time of television, and the advertisers have learned that one ounce of showing demonstrations worth a pound of talking. I try my dead level best to get my wife to buy some of the things. 
They advertise on television. She buys them, and they don't do quite what they say. My, they got some wax polish you can put on that kitchen linoleum that you can see yourself in. But it won't work when it gets over to my house. But the Lord demonstrated his kingship. Art thou our king? Yes, sir. That's the reason I was born. And that's the reason I came into the world to bear witness unto the truth, the truth of why I was born and why I came into the world. Here's a verse that'll top you down off your religious high horse if you're on one. If you've been listening to what's called the popular gospel of this hour, somewhere on the radio or somewhere, put it down if you heard it on the radio, it ain't so. God knows if anybody gets saved in spite of these radio preachers, it'll be a miracle. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. You listen when the Lord says, I was born to be a king. That's the reason I came into this world, if you was one of the truth. The reason you don't listen is you're going to hell. That's why you're going. And the reason you're going to hell is that you're not of the truth. Now, in this 14th chapter of the, God, of the book of Romans, chapter 9, is our text. Verse 9 of Romans 14. For to this end, for this purpose, that this might take place, for to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. In these two verses of Scripture, now here, Brother Barnard, you've got the only two places in the Scripture where it tells us exactly why Christ died and was raised from the dead. And both of them tell you he is born and he preached in John and he is died and he is raised in Romans just to do one thing, <clears throat> not to be a savior, but to be Lord. Now, let me repeat it. I have offered $500 reward. I'll give it to you this morning. If you'll show me one line of scripture that gave us any reason for accepting Jesus as our personal Savior. That's blasphemy. It's anti-scriptural. And it's filling hell with Baptists. That's the reason we have to have a rich crest, you know. Get all the unsaved Baptists down there to surrender to the Lord. When you surrender to the Lord, that's when you get saved. Now, the scriptures say he loved us and gave himself for us that he might deliver us from this present age, but that's just saved people. But here's something that ain't just talking about saved people. You want me to tell you why Christ died and God raised him, put him on the throne? He might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Bible scholars divide on whether this is physical death and physical life or spiritual death and spiritual life, but comes out the same thing. Of course, I believe it's spiritual, 
But whatever the interpretation comes out the same fork of the road, my Lord came down here and was born in a cow stable, lived in a body of humiliation, hung between two malefactors on a tree, buried in another man's tomb, swaddled in another man's clothing, perfumed with somebody else's bodily ointment. God raised him and enthroned him. in order that he might reestablish the sovereign rule of Almighty God over everything that rises and wriggles. How come I passed, stopped at a little brick church house somewhere on the, I turned off 22 where it said it finally found the sign Beulah Church and I came to a little church up there somewhere. And the graveyard right in front. How come those graveyards out there? That goes graves. How'd we get in the mess we're in? Chewing tobacco? No. Getting drunk? No. Going to pick the show? No. Committing adultery? No. Rebelling against the rule of Almighty God? Yes. Adam and Eve and you and I we're present, the scriptures say, and it wasn't just his sin, it is ours. God made one little prohibition to establish that he was God and we were his subjects. And we said, we'll not do it, and we broke God's law and said, we will not be under your roof. In time, God, in that most majestic scripture ever penned, God was in Christ reconciling a world to himself. You study a million years, you'll never enter into that. You just worship, can't understand it. But in time, God, very God and very man, and if this isn't so, we're just always ready to go home. There's nothing to anything if this book isn't so, if it doesn't give us the perfect record of the revelation of God in Christ to do sinners good. God was manifest in the flesh. So us beheld his glory, said God. Most of them despised him and rejected him and counted him a dross thing. God came down here. He didn't send the some advice. He came down here. Became a M-A-N man, very man, just like you and me. So we could understand his language. Touch him and be touched by him. And since man sinned, man had to be the atone, the mediator, for there is one mediator between God and man, the what? The man Christ Jesus. And you know what we did? You listen, you can hear off Barnard's old voice worn out through years, screaming, away with it. Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Crucify him! Release under us Barabbas! We will not have this man to reign over us. But praise God, whether we will or not, we will. But Jesus Christ came and died on the cross to reestablish God's rule in this world. And everything that rises and wriggles from Adolf Hitler to Khrushchev to Stalin to the murderer of a president and a senator and a Negro leader in your day and mine to the slum of the earth. are under the blessed rule of blood-stained Jesus. 
And the devil can't even weaken eyelash, except by the direct permission of him who loved me and gave himself for me. Hallelujah, what a Savior. That could take a poor law sinner. I tell you, I brag on him. He's a fine fellow. And so Jesus Christ died to establish God rule. God turned everything over to Christ, and that means Christ rule. For he must reign, First Corinthians 15, until everything be made subject to him. And when that's done, when old Hitler bows and says, Jesus is Lord, when the murder of Senator Kennedy bows and says, Jesus is Lord. When the murder of our President Kennedy bows and says, Jesus is Lord. When the monistic professors that are saying God is dead. And when the school teachers that are teaching evolution to our kids. And when this godless society that's godless because the leaders are sold out to the dollar and votes. When every last one of them has been brought into subjection to King Jesus, then he's going to turn over his job to the Father that God may be all in all. I'm quoting scripture. Brother, you can't win. Hallelujah. What a Savior. And so he saves people by establishing his rule. In your life. That's what it means to be saved. The first time you ever hear the gospel as gospel, you'll be saved. Trouble you is that the gospel ain't good news to you. Because in the language of dear old Vance Hafner, he said, I went to the old fashioned mourner's bench when I was a boy, and they took me through the motions, and I didn't know what it was all about. But when I got up off my knees, I understood one thing I had a new master. That's it, bud. I had a new master, and he is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's salvation, isn't it? A new master. Praise God. He's precious. I'm vile, but he's precious. Yes, sir. He's Lord by God's decree. His right to absolute rule over my thoughts, my body, my spirit, my work, my worship, my everything is not based on our recognition of it, but on God's recognition of his work when he hung on that gory cross. Men do not make Jesus Lord. That's what they do down at Ridgecrest. I've been there. And all over the country. Looks like I ain't much of a Baptist. Brother, I'm giving Baptist unshirted hell. I want to get back to the Christ of the Bible. Amen. And they haven't been able to kick me out yet. Listen. Who made Jesus Lord? Almighty God. I will declare that yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, Psalms 2. I will declare the decree. I won't ask anybody's advice. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Who made Jesus Lord? God Almighty. In John chapter 17, look at it. The word, these words speak Jesus, verse 1. And lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, thou hast come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him exousia, authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life. He gives eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Acts 2, 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made 
That same Jesus whom ye've crucified, both Lord and Messiah, I think one of the most damnable things that is ever invented to suit the popular taste of people who don't want to go to hell but don't want to be under God's rule and has been the heart of what's called the gospel in our circles these many years is that you take Jesus as your Savior but there ain't no such animal and sometime if it's convenient to surrender to him as Lord. And we say, won't you pretty please make Jesus your Lord? Honey, you can't. God beat you to it. He made Jesus your Lord. And you're his subject, willing or unwilling. And you're glad or mad, but glad or mad, he's been made your Lord. Now, this is the heart of evangelism and missions. Because I, uh, I have so much confidence in your blessed pastor that I take a little liberty. What we've called missions has been a joke. My God, I'm glad God's about to put it out of business. Maybe we'll buy us a Bible. Been sending folks over to China to beg those people to take Jesus. Why, the gospel don't begin but do and take. The heart of it is go over to China and put up the flag of King Jesus. He owns it anyhow. And say we occupy it in the name of the trifle owner about us. That's it. That's right. That's it. That's it. Preacher, if he's got sense enough to come around, or ain't ain't going around this country begging anybody to take anybody. He's going around, and if you're saved, you're giving voice to it. Jesus Christ, God Almighty, has turned the heathen over to him, the nations for his possession. Everything that's loose at one end and kind of rattling at the other is under his control. China and Russia and every place, godless America belongs to Jesus Christ. He bought it on the cross and you belong to him. He bought you on the cross. He, Lord, bow down. That's evangelism. His lordship is deserved. He who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, humble himself, took upon himself the form of a servant, was found in the fashion and likeness of men, and became obedient to the Father up to the point of death. I'm quoting Philippians 2. Even the death of the cross, wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. The only time in the Bible that word exalted appears. And given him a name, which is above every name, that it's the name given unto Jesus. Revelation tell you who it is, Lord of lords, King of kings. That it's the name given unto Jesus. Every knee should bow. Every tongue confess. What? Well, what's been so altered? You just didn't find it out till God put his foot on your neck and made you and then sent you to hell. That Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Not to your salvation, but to God's glory. God's going to get glory out of you if he sends you to hell. And the way he's going to get it, he's going to make you bow. Sit down until thine enemies have made thy footstool. Kiss the sun, lest it be angry and rise up in his wrath. You can't win. Hallelujah, he deserves to be Lord. One of the old Puritans said, he sits on God's throne of majesty on high. He got there by wading through the pool of his own blood. Our salvation, you better hear this. Our salvation must be grasped as salvation into that lordship. And 
with its life passion of absolute obedience and reconciled communion. We got so many people running around here, they're saved. But the will of God's not central in their life. Now that's a joke. You mean the one big thing makes you tick is not the will of God? If it isn't, you're going to hell. Right. Amen. That's what salvation's all about. We're to be conquered by him, that's salvation, mastered by him, that's salvation. Obedience will have to come for liberty, brother. He deserves and demands not our sympathy but our worship. Christ deals with no man as Savior until his sovereign rule is established in your life. This whole universe is beautiful this morning and awful hot. Beautiful as I drove. It's a beautiful world. And it is created to echo the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. And the sovereign Lord receives his subjects. He doesn't plead to anybody, he receives them. He's not standing on the outside of your heart's door, he's sitting on the throne. And the child of God, who can find but one place to glory, and that's the cross, is tickled to death that the one who deserves it is God's prime minister, God's Lord. And the child of God is willing to go to hell. If the glory of Christ would be served. A hundred years ago, you couldn't get baptized in a Baptist church in America unless you could say that. Unless you're willing to go to hell, if that would give glory to Christ, you know nothing about faith. Religion, says a deep thinker, has a meaning for men. Only if it finds in history a point to which it can absolutely surrender. Men can answer the revelation of God in Christ only by a choice, a resolve, a committal. The final meaning of conversion is not deliverance merely, but surrender and service to the uttermost. The God of absolute deliverance is also the holy God of an absolute demand that will not let go. The chief sign of salvation is not a sense of freedom, but an experience of mastery and obedience. The Lord takes possession of us, and that is conversion. If he saves you, it is that he may be our clean. And the last word of my Lord is not I save. The last word of my Lord is I claim. I claim you. I bought you. You belong to me. You're not your own. You're mine. My time's up, but I take two, three minutes for my last point. Not only is he God's Lord, by God's decree, God made him Lord. Of everybody, not just saved people, everybody. Not only is he God's Lord because he deserves to be, he died on a cross and there he bought you. But thank God he's God's Lord because he desires to be. Now this looks like going to contradict the rest of my sermon, but follow me. In Hebrews chapter 12, <clears throat> Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a crowd of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run the race, patient, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy, I wondered what that was, who for the joy that was set before him, some joy was set out before by Lord. You know, and looking at that joy, in anticipatory rejoicing of that joy, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and now, hallelujah, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
I wonder what that joy is. Now listen to Brother Barnard. Here's my explanation. Well, it's so enough. On the shoulders of my Lord Jesus Christ has been placed the responsibility of saving his own and damning everybody else, of disposing of the universe. Now, my shoulder is not big enough to do that, but Isaiah says the government shall be on his shoulder. Most solemn thing I've ever faced is as I've gone up and down the land this, this September will be 43 years. The last 36 of them I've been a hitchhike evangelist going from place to place. I'll be leaving this Friday and I won't get home till nearly Christmas away from family. And I've lived these years and I'm not complaining. I've had the best time you ever saw. I got a wonderful Lord to talk about. Well, everybody loves him or not. Bless God, he's a lovely Lord. I tell you what. Well, believe it or not, he's a lovely Lord. Praise God. Only Jesus can do sinners good, but thank God he can. Well, sir, I've had to face men and women. My heart's gone out to them because for the last six years there hadn't been enough gospel preached in America to save a flea. A hundred years ago, our churches believed the gospel. And now, if you've got a pastor that preaches the gospel, he's one out of a thousand. I mean among our Baptist preachers. That's the God's truth. This generation of church members never have heard the gospel. And you're in trouble. The chances are you're going to split hell wide open. Because you won't hear the gospel because you've already believed what Paul called another gospel. And the most solemn thing I've ever faced is twofold. Jesus Christ has got to save you or damn you. I can't save you. I can't damn you. He can save you. And he can damn you. Now, here's the other proposition. The most damnable thing I ever heard preached was to try to get people to answer the question, What will you do with Jesus? You heard that song? Jesus is standing in you, I do. What will you do with Jesus? Now, that a damn anybody that listened to it. Hear me! One time my Lord came and offered himself as the Messiah of the Jews. That's the only offer he's ever made. They rejected him. Now he's rejected them. Salvation's not an offer. Salvation's a gift. And Christ is the gift. Watch out. You don't give things to somebody unless you know they're going to be happy to get it. Christ ain't going around here trying to get nobody to accept him unless your heart's long and far. He got more sense than we got. He knows you can lead a mule to water, but you can't make him drink. If you don't want the fellowship of the saints and the joy of the Spirit and your feet on a rock and heaven on the way to heaven and life worth living, go on to hell. They'll find plenty of people that preceded you there, probably your whole family. Oh, hear me. It's not a question of what you'll do with Jesus. That's done been settled. You're going to bow to him. You're going to get out on your old knees and confess him as bow to him. And you're going to open those lips of yours and confess him as Lord. You see, it's not a question of whether you're going to do something with Jesus, just a question of when. You can reject him now, most folks do. But you'll receive him then. And since you're going to have to bow to him, that makes grace so wonderful. Isn't it wonderful that in mercy and grace, 
God Almighty, who wouldn't have to lift a finger. He didn't let you go on. And as many people will acknowledge the Lordship of Christ to the glory of the Father as they never had a gospel sermon. But in mercy, he says, if you could bow to him now. I didn't say if you will. I said if you can't. I expect most of you fix yourself up the way you, you can't. I know you won't. So if you have anything to do about you going to hell, God don't invade your will and tear up your little potato patch. You going to hell, sure? I'm preaching. That's right. That's right. But if you could, if you could bow to him now, it'd be so much better. Wouldn't that put his foot on your whole neck and make you? But you cut out this talk about what you're going to do with Jesus. You're going to bow to him. You're going to receive him. And I've been known as a grace preacher in this country. I guess I'm the most cussed preacher in this section of the Mississippi River. Woo! Every Baptist would let me preach to his corn cob. They said, that fellow believes in grace. I do. Amen. Oh, God Almighty don't owe me a thing. He's made Jesus my Lord. He hadn't left it up to me as to whether I receive him as Lord. He's going to fix that up. But in mercy, he said, how about it, old boy? If you can bow now. I'll give you a pardon. I'll put a song in your heart. I'll give you the life of the Spirit. Make you one of my family. God got anything in heaven any better than he's got down here for somebody knows Christ he's going to have to get up early and fix it up. Songs in the night. Able to see his face when all hell's popping and I walked the floor. Hundreds of nights when the heavens were brashed doors were closed and every preacher in America was cussing me. Oh, I said, oh God, am I wrong? Am I wrong? I don't know where I'm not, but I've been happy because in loving kindness Jesus came. Uh, yes, he did. My only hope, my only plea, Christ Jesus died, and he died for me. We are under orders to preach who Jesus is and what he did and to command men to repent and bow to him. Agree with God. He's Lord. I bow to him. Well, anybody believes it or not, he's a lovely Lord. Have you embraced him? Do you know the living Lord who's the Lord of life? During the First World War, a Red Cross nurse lay at the point of death, and attending her was a sister Red Cross nurse. And just a little while before the nurse died, she began to wriggle her lips and finally had very little strength left. She said, Breathe. 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 And the nurse didn't know what on earth she wanted. She brought her a glass of water, and she didn't want that. Shook her head. <clears throat> Pretty soon she said, bring. Bring. And the nurse thought maybe she wanted the Bible, and she brought the Bible, but she didn't want the Bible. That's why she said, Bring. Bring. And she thought maybe, well, she bought her a pad of paper and a pencil, thought she could write out her request, but she shook her head. And then summoning up the rest of her strength, she lifted herself on the palm of her hands, lying on her back, brought herself up into a half-sitting position. And she said, bring, 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 bring. Force the royal dim and 
crown him, Lord of oh, Better to do it in this life if you can than to be made to at the judgment. You bow your heads, our Father, in blood-stained Jesus' name. Have your way in these closing moments. Speak to hearts if it pleases you. Shut men up to this glorious Savior of hell. Get glory to this one whom we've tried to talk about. And do good for eternity bound men for whom Christ died. Would you stand to your feet?